But uh, it's a real honor to be here uh, at, at this lovely dinner in this amazing company. Um, and I just, I, I, I do, I did want to mention that um, because the theme is Babette's Feast, um, Isaac Denison is one of my favorite, favorite authors of, of all time, just, um, and, and, and one of the most incredible people uh, ever, um, as I learned uh, from you. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a real, it's, it's really, really special for me to, uh, to, to be able to be here. I remember reading, um, out of Africa many, many years ago when, when I was sort of um, struggling with, with words and reading a sentence very early on in the book that said, um, I had seen a, a herd of elephant pacing along as if they had an appointment at the end of the world. <laughs> And I just thought it was the most inc one of the most incredible sentences I'd ever read, and uh, it's that you know hit you get from a writer where you realize, oh wow, there's really no other way to say this, and it'll never be said this way again. Um, so it just burns into the memory. Um, because the theme is family saga, I'm going to be reading uh, from the beginning of The Tiger's Wife. Uh, the book is basically a, all of it a family saga, um, but uh, it all rests on sort of this opening moment uh, between Natalia, uh, who goes on to become a doctor, uh, and her grandfather um, early on in her life. So here goes. There was another scene that I was going to read from, but then I realized we'd be eating dinner, and it's sort of a grotesque scenes. I was like, maybe not, maybe not. <laughs> In my earliest memory, my grandfather is bald as a stone and he takes me to see the tigers. He puts on his hat, his big buttoned raincoat, and I wear my lacquered shoes and velvet dress. It is autumn and I am four years old. The certainty of this process, my grandfather's hand, the bright hiss of the trolley, the dampness of the morning, the crowded walk up the hill to the Citadel Park. Always in my grandfather's breast pocket, the jungle book with its gold leaf cover and old yellow pages. I am not allowed to hold it, but it will stay open on his knee all afternoon while he recites the passages to me. Even though my grandfather is not wearing his stethoscope or white coat, the lady at the ticket counter in the entrance shed calls him doctor. Then there is the popcorn cart, the umbrella stand, a small kiosk with postcards and pictures. Down the stairs and past the aviary where the sharp-eared owls sleep, through the garden that runs the length of the citadel wall framed with cages. Once there was a king here, a sultan, his janissaries. Now the cannon windows facing the street hold blocked off troughs filled with tepid water. The cage bars curve out, rusted orange. In his free hand, my grandfather is carrying the blue bag my grandma has prepared for us. In it, six-day-old cabbage heads for the hippopotamus, carrots and celery for the sheep and deer, and the bull moose, who is a kind of phenomenon. In his pocket, my grandfather has hidden some sugar cubes for the pony that pulls the park carriage. I will not remember this as sentimentality, but as greatness. The tigers live in the outer moat of the fortress. We climb the castle stairs, past the water birds and the sweating windows of the monkey house, past the, wil the wolf growing his winter coat. We pass the bearded vultures and then the bears, asleep all day, smelling of damp earth and the death of something. My grandfather picks me up and props my feet against the handrail so I can look down and see the tigers in the moat. My grandfather never refers to the tiger's wife by name. His arm is around me and my feet are on the handrail and my grandfather might say, I once knew a girl who loved tigers so much she almost became one herself. Because I am little and my love of tigers comes directly from him, I believe he is talking about me, offering me a fairy tale in which I can imagine myself and will for years. The cages face a courtyard and we go down the stairs and walk slowly from cage to cage. There is a panther, too, ghost spots paling his oil slick coat, a sleepy, bloated lion from Africa. But the tigers are awake and livid. Stripe-lashed shoulders rolling, they flank one another up and down the narrow causeway of rock, and the smell of them is sour and warm and fills everything. It will stay with me the whole day, even after I have had my bath and gone to bed, and will return at random times, at school, at a friend's birthday party, even years later, at the pathology lab or on the drive home from Galena. I remember this, too, an altercation. A small group of people stand clustered around the tiger's cage, among them a boy with a parrot-shaped balloon, a woman in a purple coat, and a bearded man who is wearing the brown uniform of a zookeeper. The man has a broom and a dustpan on a long handle, and he is sweeping the area between the cage and the outer railing. 
He walks up and down, sweeping up juice boxes and candy wrappers, bits of popcorn people have been throwing at the tigers. The tigers walk up and down with him. The woman in purple is saying something and smiling, and he smiles back at her. She has brown hair. The dustpan keeper stops and leans against the handle of his broom, and as he does so, the bigger of the two tigers sweeps by, rubbing against the bars of the cage, rumbling, and the keeper puts a hand through the bars and touches its flank. For a moment, nothing. And then, pandemonium. The tiger rounds on him, and the woman shrieks, and suddenly the dustpan keeper's shoulder is between the bars, and he is twisting, twisting his head away and trying to reach the outer railing so that he has something to hold on to. The tiger has the dustpan keeper's arm the way a dog holds a large bone, upright between his paws and gnawing on the top. Two men who have been standing by with children jump over the railing and grab the dustpan keeper's waist and flailing arm and try to pull him away. A third man jams his umbrella through the bars and pushes it over and over again into the tiger's ribs. An outraged scream from the tiger, and it stands up on its hind legs and hugs the dustpan keeper's arm and shakes its head from side to side like it's pulling on rope. Its ears are flattened, and it is making a noise like a locomotive. The dustpan keeper's face is white, and this entire time, he hasn't made a sound. Then suddenly, it's no longer worth it, and the tiger lets go. The three men fall away, and there is a splatter of blood. The tiger is lashing its tail, and the dustpan keeper is crawling under the outer railing and standing up. The woman in purple has vanished. My grandfather has not turned away. I am four years old, but he has not turned me away either. I see it all, and later there is the fact that he wants me to have seen. Then the dustpan keeper is hurrying our way, winding a piece of torn shirt across his arm. He is red-faced and angry on his way to the infirmary. At the time, I believe this is fear, but later I will know it as shame. The tigers, agitated, are lunging back and forth across the grate. The keeper is leaving a dark trail on the gravel behind him. As he passes us, my grandfather says, My God, you're a fool, aren't you? And the man says something in reply, something I know not to repeat. Instead, shrill and self-righteous in my lacquered boots and brave because my grandfather is holding my hand, I say, he's a fool, isn't he, Grandpa? But my grandfather is already walking after the dustpan keeper and pulling me along, calling for the man to stop so he can help him. Thank you. Um, thank well, you. thank you, Tia. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. Uh, one is a st struck. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm at a loss for words, except that, uh, of course, we know f from literature this uh, very special uh, connection of tenderness between grandparents and uh, grandchildren. But uh, it's a fantastic opening with this uh, combination of, uh, of violence and protection from from the grandfather and the fact that he does does not know he does not protect the child from from seeing uh, the, the 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 horrible scene or the the violent scene, but it's like an introduction to what life is all about. I, I think so. I think that there's there's sort of um, I don't know how, how different people's experiences were, but I, I certainly had this uh, sort of. Um, a mixed relationship with my grandfather in the sense that you know he was the keeper of all good things and the keeper of all good knowledge but in in that he was also the keeper of all things that were serious and grown up and 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 you know the knowledge that would come to you when you really really didn't want it and so there was this feeling of tremendous love but also tremendous fear that you would somehow disappoint him or access that knowledge too quickly or something and um so for me that's sort of the, the baseline feeling about grandparents um and uh so i i, I think that, that that's sort of where that relationship sprang from in the book. Uh, before anybody else uh, uh, bids in with their experiences of grandparents. I can't help referring to a recent uh, uh, scene uh, uh, from the Copenhagen Zoo, which was uh, much uh, advertised uh, glo globally and publicized here uh, because uh, uh, there, there was this strange slaughtering of a giraffe uh, in the Copenhagen Zoo. And it was sort of done for genetic reasons. I mean, uh, first you make 
a prison for animals, and then you uh, have to keep up the, the hygienic, uh, the gen how, how do you call it? The genetic hygiene? And eliminate the bad genes. So uh, they slaughtered a giraffe in front of uh, the audience. And it was apparently a quite a, a popular scene. And, um, and the director of the zoo said, well, uh, we want to uh, give an alternative to the Walt Disney kind of animal story. We want to show children what real life is about. So th th was he a grandfather or? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I don't, I don't envy whoever it is whose grandfather he probably was. Um, <laughs> you can imagine what goes, home, uh, goes on with the family pets at home, my God. Um, no, but uh, that's a terrible joke. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think, you know, zoos are such fascinating places when it comes to, 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 to this kind of dynamic because, you know, there is this sort of disnification all the time, right? You're going there to see the animals. They're protected from their normal relationship, like predator-prey relationship, you know, the, the animals that are, that are prey are just sort of there with bales of hay and carrots and whatever, and um, it, it sort of takes all the wildness out of them. But then the, the strangest things happen like that, or um, the Belgrade Zoo, on which the, the, the zoo in this book is, is heavily based, um, is, really is built into um, a fortress, into a, an old citadel. Um, and it's kind of the coolest possible space for a zoo, but then you have things happen, like there's also a really famous restaurant that's at the top of the cliff, um, overlooking the... Uh, carnivore pits and every so often somebody gets really really loaded and falls off and into the carnivore pits <laughs> and people are around you know because it happens during the day and you know it's this it's this sort of so real real life I think grandparents or no always creeps into these situations <laughs> does anyone have to uh, want to say something about grandparents or animals <laughs> or, or what or yeah I mean STF of course <laughs> No, no, you're breathing like you have a question, so you must ask one now. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, again, I was just so mesmerized. I was so mesmerized by your reading, and um, <laughs> I wanted to know what role the grandfather and, and because I haven't read the book yet, and, the, and the, the young narrator, because it begins, you know, she's four years old, and I wanted to know if that relationship continues and how it evolves and how that mirrors the rest of the book. It does, yeah. Um, it's the central relationship. Thank you for your question. It's the central relationship in the book. Um, it, the, the next chapter, the, the book actually begins following this particular scene with uh, Natalia, who's in her um, early 30s, learning that her grandfather has, has died under mysterious circumstances. And uh, she's sort of a, a, a broad... Um, inoculating orphans as sort of this goodwill gesture and she tries to piece together the circumstances of his death based on the stories that he told her um, when he was alive but it's the core it's the core relationship for the entire book um, and so I think you know you you get to know the character of the grandfather really really well um, based on the stories yeah 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 so, thank you thanks <laughs> thank you yes uh, uh, you want to say something yeah Thing. Sorry. I think of your book as mostly about people, but then you read this chapter, and it's been a while for me to hear it again. But And then also talking about the elephant quote, I was wondering, oh, maybe animals have more of a role in your writing than I maybe picked up on. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. I, um, I, I was told... Um, thank you for, for for your question too. I I am um, I was told recently, not recently. I was told maybe two years ago that that it turns out that animals really do show up in my writing quite a bit. Um, and at first, you know, it, it sort of became this 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 joke among friends who who you know who were who were reading my work. And 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 then it's turned out that um, and you know for a while I was like, oh maybe it has some sort of you know totemic presence. Like I don't know, maybe animals are in there. But but usually. Um, for this book in particular, I, you know, I wrote from the perspective of, of the tiger, um, and uh, you know, there's a, a number of other animals who come in, um, and it's sort of, there's something incredibly, for me, writing is often about um, indulgence. Uh, that's, that's sort of why um, I, I write fiction 
because you know you get to make things up and and have these experiences that you wouldn't normally have and um for me there's nothing sort of more indulgent or fanciful or fun in the act of writing which can often be sort of head wrecking and and, and horrifying <laughs> for me at least um than than inhabiting you know an animal in, in some ways so um so from the craft standpoint it's it's really that it's just this this great sort of luxury <laughs> Um, That's so great to hear. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>